So, welcome to another edition of the Brazilian Shirt Name Podcast. The Legendino, I see, is there. You've heard the news today, uh, Legendino. As we speak, Gareth Southgate has resigned after the Euros. I have, yes. Yeah. So, perhaps this is a good time to speak about England winning a final. Oh, absolutely perfect time. And we've got the perfect person to talk about winning a final, and not just a final. Arguably, it was the defining final uh, for the women's team. But Kieran Thievman, I should have asked you how to pronounce it. Go on, Kieran, tell me. <laughs> apologies. I apologies. It's fine, Dotton. It's fine. It, it, that, that is the mistake that most people make, is they go with the th at the beginning. Is it Taven Ankanen? It's Taver Manaharan. Taver Manaharan. Taver Manaharan. Now that yeah. you've told me where the mistake is, I'll always get it right. Taven Prokoharan. <laughs> <laughs> That's an even better way of remembering it. But yeah, anyway, Kieran Thieber Manaharan, thank you very much for joining us. You've written the book, haven't you, on the lionesses at the uh, Euros. What do you remember? And tell us the name of the book as well. What do you remember about the day itself? Because I remember it has been quite um, a historic day, or it turned out to be historic for more than just football, I think. Yeah, so I, I actually wrote a book on the making of the Women's World Cup, Dot, and so it was a bit broader than than England at the Euros. But I guess where, where I have quite a strong link to that day is I was actually working... I was in the stands as a fan that day, but I was actually working for the English Football Association. So I also worked as the communications manager for the women's professional games. So I worked as sort of the, the comms lead for the Women's Super League and the Women's FA Cup, but was very much there on the day as a fan. Um, but yeah, very, very memorable for, for obviously multiple reasons. Obviously a sold out Wembley Stadium, um, you know, and, and the result going our way, which is obviously something that we're not necessarily overly used to. The, the first it, thing that I want, would want to come in with there is a little bit kind of David Byrne. How did we get here? Because uh, you know, it's 30 years now that I moved abroad. And at that time, 94, I don't remember the concept of the lionesses. And I don't, I don't think they were very good. And then I remember being back for the, the London Olympics in 2012. And I did some radio with uh, Faye White, you know, former right. Arsenal and, and England captain, I think. And it was team in the Olympics, Team GB were going to be playing Brazil. And team GB was essentially England. I think we won Scotland player. It was essentially England. And Brazil, in the years before, had been probably the best side in the world. They hadn't quite won, but they'd probably been the best side of the world. And I'm doing radio with her. And, and Faye White's saying, yeah, I think England's going to, uh, GB's going to win this game. I'm thinking, you what? You, you what? You were, and then I was at the game at Wembley, and Team GB won one nil. And I'm thinking, well, and there was a huge crowd. I'm thinking, well, where where has all this come from? You know, how how, how did we get here? So, w what's the backstory? Because in the early World Cups, England really aren't aren't in a running. And how does it go from there to a team that takes the field on the 31st of July 2022 with a realistic chance of winning the European title? Yeah, it's quite a loaded question, that, Tim. Um, 2012 was quite a defining moment, I think. Obviously, you're referencing the the, the Team GB win over Brazil. I think there were 70,000 people at Wembley Stadium that day. And and you're right, you know, when Marta rolls into town and, and, and the, the other, you know, members of that team who, you know, had more of a pedigree of playing in big games, you know, they. I listened to your um, your podcast that you did, I think, towards the end of last year where you, you focused on Brazil's win over the United States in the 2007 World Cup. Um, you know, that was Marta's tournament. That was the moment that she kind of entered the world and, and announced herself. And, um, you know, over the years, we've not seen Brazil necessarily progress as much as we'd like. Obviously, having a World Cup in, in, yeah. in the coming years is going to be massive for them. And, and I hope for them that they can really grasp that very much like England have done over the last sort of couple of years. But I, I think... You know, and, and it's, I've got to try and take my um, not not wear my FA or former FA hat too much in this in this podcast because it would be very easy for me to wax lyrical about some of the things that they've done. But I, I do think that you know the formation of the Women's Super League in 2011 was obviously quite significant. You went from the competition in England, formerly known as the the Women's Pro National Premier League, it was an amateur competition. 
Um, Arsenal dominated year after year after we can't, year. We can't have and, that. <laughs> well, the FA clearly felt that way as well. I think oh, they, they wanted a more... Um, they wanted a more competitive competition. They wanted to be in a position where it wasn't just the same team dominating, you know, time after time. And, and ultimately, as well, they wanted to be able to create a league and an environment that was going to feed into the national team as well. So the formation of the of the Super League in 2011, I think, was significant because all of a sudden you had a semi-professional competition. Players were on the pitch more often. They were getting more training time. Um, and and that sort of build up that year they had in the build up to the Olympics. Um, the, the 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 occasion of the Olympics as well on, on its own is 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 big enough, isn't it? You know, it's you had players there who um, I know the men's competition is an under twenty three tournament, isn't it, with a few overage players, whereas the women's competition is fully senior. So it's seen as a massive occasion. It's seen as a big tournament, a big competition to win a gold medal. Um, so I think GB went into that very, you know, with a with a real kind of ambition to do well, with a real ambition to um, announced themselves one of a better term and I think they recognize that the Olympics along with the we have to say the men's world cup the women's world cup continues to draw big audiences but alongside the men's world cup is the most watched competition in in the world and and it was an opportunity for them to you know really grasp that spotlight and try and do well um and and hopefully see more investment and growth of the game come as off the back of that well, what I would like to say in response to <clears throat> Tim's uh, question is, you may ask yourself, <laughs> how did we get here? You may ask yourself, where was everybody else? You may ask yourself, is this my wife? But the most important thing to remember, Tim, is that women's football, I would have thought in any case, Kieran, is that women's football was on a roll. Okay, England hadn't picked up on it um, till pretty much late in the day, but for other countries, countries like the United States, the Scandinavian countries, and even arguably Brazil, because of Martha, they were way ahead of us. Yeah, but and the, that was the, the Brazil was, was a kind of spontaneous thing that really hadn't had very little to do with uh, um, things going on at administrative level, and, and even perhaps in society, I don't know. Uh, it's certainly different from the states or northern Europe, well, which the point, you know, I, I looked I looked at as the countries that really got this thing up up and rolling. The states and yeah. northern Europe, where I, I, I the totally role of the, the role of women, I think that, that that had been a battle that had been fought and great progress had been made. Well, in the states, I think it was slightly different. I think in slightly different in the states, it was about equality generally, equality laws in exactly. America. If I'm right, exactly. Kieran, yeah, exactly. Whereas in Scandinavia, northern Scandinavia, it was feminism. Yeah, very much so. I think talking about the nine, you know, the the the, women, the US women, ninety nine was a big moment for them. That was their opportunity to use winning the the World Cup in nineteen ninety nine as leverage to as you say, try and get more equal treatment. Obviously, um, women's sports in the college system is seen as equal to male um, participation as well. So that's a significant thing. You have that pathway from the college system into the professional game. Um, but obviously, off the back of the 99ers winning the World Cup, you obviously had professional leagues that unfortunately started and failed initially. You had two um, you had two uh, professional leagues in the United States that were set up in the 2000s. Um, WUSA, WUSA and the WPS were both set up in the 2000s and both unfortunately collapsed due to financial problems. Mm. But, uh, you know, back in 2013, we had the launch of the NWSL and, and that's still going strong now, one of the strongest professional leagues in, in the world of, of women's football. But, um, yeah, and then in Scandinavia, you had Marta played for, for Umea in, in Sweden, where she played Umeå. the Umeå. Umeå. Yeah. Um, yeah. You can correct me how, on my pronunciation. How close now, right? is how close is that to Erdeburg? Uh No, it's hundred or nearly probably over a thousand, about a thousand miles. No, maybe even more. Umeå is in the north of Sweden, in the northeast. Uh, Göteborg yeah. is in the <laughs> southwest, and uh, Sweden, that peninsula, is two and a half times the size of Britain. Right. So you can yeah, figure that a, one it's out. It's a long way. It's a long way to Tipperary and Umeå. <laughs> but they but they had they I mean they had a number of internationals at Umeå and, and in the, the Swedish Damelsvenskan at that time. Yeah. The German Frau Bundesliga as well was offering, I think, in professional football in, in certain clubs as well. 
so you, you did have you did have certain countries in Europe that were able to try and offer competitive professional women's football better environments better opportunities um, which is why Marta played you know a good portion of her career in the 2000s in Sweden how did you know England this go no let me say very quickly off the back of this do you know what this tells us Tim it tells us um that Britain and women in Britain were less uh, or at least Britain was less feminist mm -hmm. and that Britain was less equal between the genders that's what this tells me immediately sure. that sure. whoa this is what, how we got here in answer to your question indeed yeah so how did England manage to leapfrog over the Dam and Svenska? Uh, no, yeah, <laughs> Dam Al Svenskan. Dam Al, yeah, Dam Al Svenskan. Nice England managed to leapfrog over to Dam Al Svenskan uh, and uh, Norway and so on, and some of the countries that were very, very strong. How did England manage to leapfrog these countries? So we, we're taking a pitch here at Wembley against Germany with a, with a real shot at the title. How did that happen? Yeah, I think um, I think the professionalisation of the of the women's super league was a big part of that. Um, that came in twenty seventeen eighteen. Um, commercial partner coming on board in Barclays, who invested a lot of money into the competition. All of a sudden, now you had twelve professional clubs who were competing. Um, Did the others move backwards? Is it England moving I, I, forwards when the others were moving yeah. backwards? I, I'm not sure if it was moving backwards, Tim, or whether it was stood still. Um, I think I think what they what you saw was a number of countries look at what was being done in England and they looked at England as the blueprint and all of a sudden they realised that actually we need to for one of a better term get our butt into gear and and try and improve what we're doing. I think ultimately as well you had big. I mean we see the 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 lure and the money that's in the Premier League. You also had Premier League clubs like Arsenal, Chelsea, Manchester City, all of a sudden recognising that there was commercial opportunity in their women's teams and they started to invest in their women's sides. And those Damos Svenskan sides that are largely independent or maybe linked to Swedish men's teams that don't have the financial power of the Premier League, all of a sudden they can't offer the financial packages and the and the wages that, you know, a WSL club like Arsenal or Chelsea can. You know, we're talking about players now earning and look, it's it's small fry compared to the men's game, but we're talking about six figure salaries in the women's game over a year now, whereas you know that was unthinkable ten, fifteen years ago. So, the the money that's been that's been invested into the women's game in England is is significant in that in that progress and leapfrogging some of those leagues. But I think also um, I think one of the things that that's probably played a part is the is the um, the development of St George's Park as well. I think the England women's team having that as their base, having those facilities that are equal to the men, having the pitches that are there that are, that they have access to, it, it, it's massive. Um, and I think, you know, they've they've invested not just on the pitch, but they've invested off of it with, you know, the, the staff that are around that team now. And we're, we're, we're ready for a shootout, aren't we? We're ready for a shootout because uh, our team is White Earps. That's one for <laughs> people who know their Western history. You know, the centre forward is White and the goalkeeper is Earps. Uh, where have these players come from? What's their their background? How how have they that, that they come through? Yeah, so I guess it, it, for some of them, especially those players towards the back end of their career, the Jill Scotts, the Ellen Whites that you that you mentioned, they will have seen the game transition like they probably never expected. As I said, they were playing amateur football just over ten years ago. Um, they then had the opportunity to play for semi professionally, um, and then, as I said, sort of towards the end of the the twenty tens, they. They had a fully professional league. Some of them went abroad at various times in their career. Um, Rachel Daly, who who played left back in that final um, against Germany, um, played a, a, a good portion of her career in the United States for the Houston Dash. Um, you know, they, we have seen players from England over the years go abroad to be able to try and have that professional environment that they weren't necessarily getting at home. But following the formation of the, as I say, the professional women's super league. We saw a lot more players wanting to play at home, having the opportunity to develop and the facilities that the same as, as the men, as I say, Chelsea women train at Cobham, Arsenal women train at London Colney. You know, they, they all of a sudden weren't, dare I say, second class citizens. They were being treated the same as their men's teams. And I think that's where they've come from. They've seen that development from, you know, Chelsea. I, I worked as a freelance reporter and, and I was going to watch Chelsea women at play at Staines, you know, with sometimes three, four hundred people. 
you know, we've now got situations where Chelsea are playing at Stamford Bridge, Arsenal are selling out the Emirates. It's just, it's just been, you know, it's a word that's very often used in the women's game and I hate to sort of throw it in because it's very cliche, but it has been a journey for the women's game and for these players. What about their social background? Um, what kind of, is how, are there, there are similarities and differences with the men's team? And one thing that looks apparent just from looking at them is that it, it, it's, uh, the women's team is, is, is whiter than the men's team. Yeah, and I, and I think that's something that the the FA are aware of. I think one of the things that has been a problem in the women's game and and has been acknowledged is is accessibility. I think with the um, the way that regional talent centres and academies were set up, they were in leafy suburbs that were inaccessible if you didn't have access to a car or if you didn't have a parent who was able to take you to the, one of those centres. So I think there were probably talented young girls from ethnic backgrounds, non-white backgrounds that were not being given the opportunities that they should do. Um, one of the ways that I know the FA and, and I worked on this project when I worked there, um, one of the ways that they're trying to tackle that is the launch of post Euros of um, emerging talent centres. So these emerging talent centres, I think there's over 70 of them in the country now, um, where they are looking to try and give girls those opportunities that maybe they haven't had in the past. And I think Emma Hayes has spoken about it as well in the past, about these leafy suburbs and how you know, players from from maybe sort of underprivileged backgrounds or low economic backgrounds haven't had that opportunity. And, you know, the hope is that in five years, 10 years, it's going to take time, but hopefully in 10 years time, we see the makeup being a little bit different um, because it has, there's no doubt about it. It has been a very, there were articles during the Euros. It, it's a very, it was a very white team. I, I, I mean, a, a lot of this, speaks to the fact that Kevin Costner was right when he said, you, if you build it, they'll come. And I think that there's another challenge, you know, which is the elephant in the room with regards to women's football being um, uh, much, much more um, available throughout the board, which is that there are some communities, and I don't necessarily mean, by the way, the South Asian community, despite Bend It Like Beckham, who still haven't quite absorbed the idea of girls playing football. And, you know, and those communities are right across the board, whether it be white communities, there are many communities think, you know, girls shouldn't play football. You still hear that, don't you? Um, not as loudly as you once heard them. But it, it reminds me of a time in the 1960s and 70s when there was already uh, post-war immigration and basically embedded itself. There was already a second generation of young black and brown kids in this country who weren't able to get through because their parents are like, well, hang on a second, we brought you here or we came over here to for you to be able to establish yourself through a traditional profession. So... Now that has changed, <laughs> certainly within the African, West African community, because they'll say, well, what's the point of a traditional, uh, a tra a traditional um, yeah, job profession when, you know, you can earn a lot more money and be happier playing football? But I don't think it's quite got there with the women yet. No, I think I think that's I think that's a fair comment. I think that's that's something that we are we are seeing change where, you know, the. I think the WSL is an example of we are now seeing a few more players from different backgrounds, but we're not seeing enough. Um, you know, I'm from a from a mixed race self. You know, my my father was Sri Lankan and mum white English, and you know, I'm I'm always keen to see more Asian representation across both men's and women's football. We don't necessarily have it in the women's game as much as we would like, but my hope is, as you said, Dotton, is we now that it's actually a feasible career that you can earn good money from. Hopefully. We do see more from from those backgrounds taking an interest. So you're in the stands as a fan. It's May. The, it's uh, July the thirty first, two thousand and two. Are you confident as the teams come out? Are you confident? What what are, what are your feelings? Do you know what Tim? I was, and and the reason I was confident was, you know, Serena Viegman had been in charge of England. She she'd taken over um, from from Phil Neville in in September twenty one. She managed the Netherlands at the Tokyo Olympics, the delayed Tokyo Olympics, and it was known prior to that Olympics that she was going to be taking the job. Um, I think what was fascinating going into that Euros is that England knew nothing other 
than essentially winning. They, they'd drawn a couple of games here and there, but they were undefeated under Serena Wiegmann going into that tournament. Um, you know, they played two warm-up matches uh, ahead of the competition against the Netherlands at home, who were the reigning European champions, and Switzerland away, who were not a, not a bad side. They beat the Netherlands 5-1 at Ellen Road, and they went to Switzerland and won 4-0. They then went through the competition. Um, they beat Austria on the opening game. We're, we're unconvincing in that opening game at Old Trafford. I think it would be fair to say they beat them 1-0. But then they went and beat Norway 8-0 down at Brighton. And this was a Norway team that had some some really good players in it. And they absolutely tore them apart. Um, I couldn't actually believe what I was watching. Um, then they beat Northern Ireland 5-0, which I, I think Northern Ireland an emerging side, but not at the levels of, of a Norway. So... You know, and then you get to the knockout stage, and I think one of the and we're, and we're obviously recording this the soon after England have unfortunately the men's side have lost their Euro final, and one of the criticisms of Gareth Southgate was the timing of his substitutions. One of the things that Serena Wiegmann did really well throughout that tournament was the timing of her substitutions, and it largely centred on Ella Toon and Alessia Russo. And in those knockout games, she brought those two on around the hour mark, roughly in the in the knockout games. Ella Toon scored in the game against Spain in the quarterfinals when England had gone behind. Alessia Russo scored in the semi-final against Sweden in the 4-0 win. And then Ella Toon came on as a sub and scored in the final as well. So she used her substitutions really well. And the big thing they had was momentum. They hadn't tasted any kind of defeat of any note whatsoever under Serena Wiegmann. They had a really talented group. She was really fortunate with injury. She had pretty much a full fit squad going into that competition. So I've given you a very long-winded answer, Tim. Apologies, but no, yeah, I, I, I was confident. Beautiful. I was confident. I was confident going into that final because England just had a huge amount of momentum, and you just felt under Serena Wiegmann that they just couldn't lose. That that was the genuine feeling. What's her secret? Do you think? Well, I'm reading a book at the moment, and I'm halfway through. So I wish I'd read the whole thing if mm -hmm. I'd known that I was going to be coming on. She's she's. I think she's people first. I think that's the, the big thing for her. She wants to get to know the players. She wants to know what makes them tick. I think that, you know, you can be the absolute best coach, but if you don't know the players that you're coaching, and I think it makes it a lot more difficult. Um, you hear the players talk and they, they talk about how they, you know, I think she's, she's not a woman to be messed with. I think if you get on the wrong side of her, or if you, um, if you're not on it in training or if you have a really disappointing game and it's perceived that you've not put the effort in, I'm pretty certain that Serena will come down on you hard. But she's also got that um, that side of her that is, uh, is, is a good ear, will listen, um, interested in the players person, you know, as, as people, not just as footballers. Um, and I think it was a very different, you know, it was... The players were getting a coach who had pedigree in the women's game. Let's not forget that Serena had won the Euros in 2017. She'd got to the final of the Women's World Cup in 2019, which they lost to a very strong United States side. Prior to Serena, and I'm, I'm not going to use this platform as a, as a, as a chance to criticise, but it was Phil Neville who was the manager before Serena, who had no pedigree in the women's game, didn't really know the players, didn't really know the structure of the women's game. And all of a sudden, they've gone from that to wow, we've got one of the best coaches in the women's game that we could possibly have got. And I think that was a big thing for the women. They they looked at it and thought, we've got a genuine winner here who can help us win. Yeah, so going back to the match, and I'm not going to use this platform to criticise anybody. Phil Neville's a nice guy. I've met him uh, at the BBC. But I think most of us were gobsmacked to... Uh, see him get appointed as the uh, coach of the women's team. And perhaps that speaks to where we all were socially, culturally and otherwise. But anyway, going back to the match, England scored first. They did, yeah. And I think it obviously came in the, in the second half. I think it's one of those where they had a few chances in the first half, as did Germany. Um, you kind of get to nil-nil at half time, And while I was confident, Going into that game, as I've already mentioned, you're you're sort of going into that second half with a few more nerves. Um, at the back of my mind as well, I'm also thinking about the longer... It's, it's interesting, as I say, I worked for the FA at the time, looking after the domestic women's game. And throughout that second half, 
I'm wanting England to win and I'm wanting us to do well, but I'm also thinking I've got a lot of work that I'm going to have to be doing over the next week or two because all of a sudden, you know, the pressure of capturing the momentum and translating that and transferring that into the domestic game. I'm thinking if we win today, I've got a busy few months coming up. But, you know, so the the goal obviously was from Ella Toon. Um, it's a pass through from Kieran well, well, Walsh. What, what a fantastic goal. It's it an was. unbelievable goal, isn't it? I mean, the pass yeah. from Walsh is just, it's perfect. It's an, it's, yeah. it's a f- perfect pass. And, and then, that's Kira Walsh. That's Kira Walsh, Tim. That's Kira Walsh. You know, she, she is one of the best passers of the ball in, in, in the world, in the women's game. You know, she, she has that vision. She has that composure. And, and what's interesting is that, you know, Ella had made that run beyond the, the forward line. Obviously, players as an attacking midfielder. She's kind of made that run beyond the forward line and has managed to time it to the point where the ball is over the top. It's kind of bounced nicely in front of her and she's managed to, you know, she's got choices, hasn't she? She can either smash it, she can either try and side foot it past the keeper and she's probably done the hardest part of lobbing it over, which we know we've seen many times can, you know, if you get it wrong, it goes over the bar or if you get it wrong, it can end up in the goalkeeper's hands and you you end up a little bit embarrassed. But She's she's executed it so well. And I think that, that what's helped that is the weight of the pass from Kira mm. Walsh. It's just set up mm. so nicely for her. It, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's an unbelievable goal, isn't it? For a final, uh, yeah, both yeah. the pass and the finish are just absolute technical perfection. It's not quite a dink, is it? Because it's got a little bit more uh, welly to it than a dink. And that's where your heart goes in your mouth, thinking, oh, she's overdone it, she's overdone it. She's kicked it rather than dinked it, you know? But- did, you, did you have a good view of it, Kieran? I did. So I was I was um, along the sideline. I'm in the, I mean, I was up in the gods at Wembley. Um, but you could just see as soon as the pass was made from, from Kira, you could see that she was through. Um, and I think because you're high up, you've got a good idea of how high that ball has looped over the goalkeeper. Mm. Was when you're low down, the ball goes up. It's sort of probably in your eye line. It's over the bar, but it's actually underneath. But you can't see that from the perception that you've got. So being higher up was an advantage because I could actually see that as soon as she'd hit the ball, you could see that it was dipping under the bar. So, yeah, phenomenal, phenomenal goal. And, you know, the the reaction from the crowd as well, because, you you know, as I said, we weren't used to losing under Serena. So you go ahead and all of a sudden you genuinely start to think this could actually happen. Did you did you think that that was it? No, no, I didn't because Germany are a good side. And, and you know, we, we, we mentioned Brazil and we mentioned uh, um, the, in the United States and, and the North and Scandinavian side, Sweden, Norway. But Germany dominated women's football in the 2000s you know they won back-to-back world cups in 2003 2007 they've won multiple european titles as well you know if there's one team in the euros that i was never going to count out it was going to be germany they have that very similar to the men's side they have that kind of never say die attitude it's very much the game is never over until it's actually over because you always feel they've got something in them they had some they had some lovely players you know i think they were they were dealt a real blow though um, before the game. You know, we got into the we got into our seats, and obviously the team news started to filter through. And Alexandra Pop, who was top scorer in the tournament, she pulled out of the of the starting lineup in the warm up. Um, and that was, if we're honest, that's when you start to think really it could be our day because you've got their their biggest threat in front of goal. All of a sudden, isn't in the starting lineup. Not just not in the starting lineup. She didn't she didn't feature at all. So, you know, when Alex pop out, um, you know that you've got a chance, but they still had a, they still had an abundance of talent. Um, and, and they're, they're carrying a threat them. down that, that right, their right-hand side, aren't they? They, they keep they getting are. in down that right-hand side. And their equalising yeah. goal, in its quieter way, I think is as technically brilliant as, as, as our first goal. So it's, yeah, it's a stupendous Lina, finish. Lina. Yeah, from Lena McGall, who is who is you know in, incredibly talented and you know and and plays a little bit deeper than than an Alex Pop, but is is got a you know she's got a knack of scoring important goals as well. And you know they they you always felt that they had something in them. You know you always felt that one was probably not going to be enough. Um, and you know that that proved to be the case. And I think that came what was it about twelve or thirteen minutes before the end, wasn't it? It was in the seventy something minute. 
and and it's then that you sort of the nerves start to really take over a little bit and it's, it's, it's almost an impossible finish what she does you know the ball's come across yeah. her low from the right and with a she opens up her left foot yeah and puts it in that it's really really hard that one really yeah. hard. with the Beautiful. with the defender right yeah. next to her right tight with her yeah yeah um, and i'm sure england will probably be disappointed with the with the way they've defended it but it's a, it's an unbelievable finish, and and that's the sort of that that's why you never felt that after Ella Toon's goal that it was done and dusted because you always felt that Germany had something in them and they had the players that could hurt you like that. Momentum, Germany. You're worried now. Yeah, I think I think you were you were I think you were worried, but as I say, I'll go back to to sort of my original point of we hadn't tasted any kind of defeat under Serena Wiegmann, and and you know you always felt that there was something in the locker that could potentially change the game. England had plenty of talent on the pitch. Obviously, Ella had come on. Alessia Russo had come on. Um, I think she she brought on Jill Scott towards the end, who's obviously very experienced, was probably probably remembered more for that final for some of the naughty language that she used in, a, in during the game. But um, yeah, she they, there was plenty of options. Chloe Kelly obviously came on. I'm sure we'll talk about it in a second. But the the real benefit that Serena had is she had an enormous depth in that squad and she had players that she could bring off the bench that could change things. Yeah, watching it from home, um, although I have been up in the gods at Wembley uh, a few times, it's not a nice place to be when you <laughs> really want to get a great view of a match. And I've been behind the goalposts uh, to the, uh, uh, up in the gods as well. But watching it from home, I don't think... I was concerned because I think I saw England beat France in the semi-final, wasn't it? Was it France? Sweden. Sweden. Sweden, Sweden, Sweden. semi-finals. Sweden. Okay. But um, I thought that they had beaten them. Um, and I, as I've said before on this podcast, I was in Sweden just before uh, these Euros. And it looked, from their point of view, like they would win. So when you thought, when I saw the, the Swedish... Um, basically feeling that they had one hand on, on the tournament or on the title and England beat them, then I thought, OK, they've beaten one of the strongest contenders. They're still in the game throughout. And I don't think, crucially, I don't think the England team uh, felt dejected. In what was, you know, a relatively late goal by, um, um, you know, by Germany, but... I don't think, you know, in the men's team, you, you see an equaliser um, against them and it does feel as if they've had a punch in the solar plexus. But I think that the England women's team had their tails up throughout this. And despite being somewhat, you know, you could see disheartened at the German goal, I think they, they still believed that they were going to win this. And that's what carried them through if you're talking about momentum. Yeah, and, and I, I think you're absolutely right. And I think Leah Williamson, the captain, said that exact thing. They never, they never felt when Germany equalised that there was there was any kind of fear. And I think that's one of the things that, that that's been you know clearly worked on a lot across both the men's and the women's teams of England is removing that fear factor, removing that that sort of anxiety that comes with crucial moments where that maybe have gone against you a little bit. Um, you know, we saw, um, you know, them come from the, the the big one. I think probably gave them belief was that quarter final win over Spain, where they were one nil down at down at Brighton and and came back to win two one. Um, you know, Spain obviously went on to win the World Cup a couple, of, you know, a year later, year and a half later. But I think they they <laughs> had a genuine belief, even when behind or level with a team, that they were still capable of winning football matches. Who's having the best chances now? When it's one-one, last ten minutes, and then in, into extra time, who do you think's on top? It's it's really difficult because it, it at that point it's all a little bit of a blur because you're kind of preparing yourself for extra time. I think it's one of those where each team is is trying to is trying to kind of grab that winner. Um, it, it's interesting. I, the, the last ten minutes is a little bit of a blur. I don't remember an awful lot about it, um, so it's it's a difficult one. But I think at that point as well, you're. I guess your mentality and your head goes to we want to win, but we also don't want to blow this. And and I'm thought you know we saw it on on Sunday in the men's final with with Spain scoring so late. You know the last thing you want to do is concede late, and then all of a sudden you've got no time to to try and level it up. So, you know 
you almost go into that extra time period and and you've got 30 minutes to potentially try and get a winner and then hold on um so yeah the last the last 10 was a little bit of a blur um from memory i remember both teams having a couple of chances but um yeah it's um it's not it's not that vivid as 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 maybe it should be and i suppose it's the least of the yeah. it's the least of the three goals, isn't it? It's the least. It's, yeah. it's something isn't of a it, lucky just, scramble. No, after after two match. wonderful goals, it's a real scrappy do effort that that defines things, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is, and and, and ultimately, you know, I guess when you play it out in your head, if you're going to score the winner in a in a final of of or any final, it's not how you're going to picture it. You're going to picture a you know, a 20 yard screamer or a, a one-on-one with the goalkeeper where you've rounded them or chipped it over them. I guess similar to what Ella Toons, Ella Toons was worthy of winning it, wasn't it? But no, it's a corner whipped in, isn't it? It's kind of bounced around a little bit and, and Chloe Kelly, I think has had a, had a poke at it. It's kind of been blocked and then she's had another poke and, and sort of managed to, to get it in the net. And they had a um, chance to clear, didn't they? Germany should have cleared. They did. They did. They did. And, and she, when they didn't clear, she took advantage and, yeah, you kind of um, you're kind of you you know you go into this sort of space of we've not been here before in terms of there's there's not an awful lot of time left. Um, Chloe Kelly has ripped her shirt off and is waving it around her head, um, and all of a sudden there's comparisons made to to Brandy Chastain for when she won the you know won the World Cup in 1999, scored the winning penalty and and took her shirt off and. Um, you know, it's an it's an iconic image. You know, it's something that that was used and seen in marketing adverts and TV adverts, and um, you know, it was it was quite fitting as well. Coming from Chloe, Chloe's a you know a West London West London girl, and you know, um, it's not quite as maybe poetic as maybe a Raheem Sterling scoring a final going to school literally up the road from from Wembley Stadium, but um, yeah, it was it was incredible. You know, you don't. At that stage, you don't really care how they go in, do you, as long as they do. Do you have a good view of it? Not really, no. Because of the bundle, because of the um, because of the kind of scrap, as you say, it was very sort of lots of bodies. You sort of, uh, you see the sort of melee of players all kind of crowded together. And then the next thing you know, the crowd has erupted. Um, so no, I'd be lying if I said I did. But uh, I certainly remember that feeling of the of the crowd going up. And it's it's one of those where... Because obviously Wembley is so big, and I was just to the left of the halfway line, it's almost like a Mexican wave of noise because it starts at the end where the goal is, and then when people have realised that it's gone in, it very quickly makes its way to the other end. So, um, yeah, incredible. I imagine that most you know people who were not the right side of the halfway line haven't seen it go in, but they've heard the noise and just reacted. You know, um, the the moment was the moment. At the moment that go, or the moment I saw that celebration, and I saw the other England players, and saw what they meant, what it meant to them, I knew that things had changed at that point. I thought, this is it; it's never going to be the same for women's football in England. I didn't know that um, the women's teams, club teams, uh, let alone the Lionesses, would sell out Arsenal, and that's just still—it's mind blowing. You know, it's gobsmacking. But I knew that it had changed. Even if Germany somehow equalised from that moment, very little time to do that, or it went into extra time or penalties, whatever, I knew the women's game would never be the same again. Did you know that? When you watched it, you mentioned the months ahead that you, of extra work that you would get. Did you know that at that point, this is it, yeah, I'm in for the for the marathon? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I think a lot of people did, um, whether it was fans, whether it was players, whether it was people from within the FA. I mean, I spoke, I, I worked, I worked very closely with Kelly Simmons, who was the director of the women's professional games, not not at the FA now. But, you know, Kelly had always said to me, it's just going to take us to win a tournament and the game's going to explode. What what we saw, um, you know, prior to, to 2022 was England get to the semifinals of both the World Cup 2015, World Cup 2019 and the Euros in 2017. And we saw gradual kind of gradual growth off the back of all three of those tournaments. Where the women's game really suffered was off the back of the 2019 semi-final because we saw that first season in the domestic game after that World Cup semi-final in, in 2019 
attendance is growing, interest growing, and then the season was curtailed, much like it was across the board, um, by the pandemic. Uh, and and we had a season behind closed doors where we couldn't get supporters into the into the ground. Um, so when we came back, you know, we we had some catching up to do, and the Euros just it was almost like a cheat code because all of a sudden you had this enormous momentum to be able to try and capture and translate that and transfer that into the domestic, not just a domestic game. I've mentioned that a few times, Dotton, because that was the area I worked in, but the grassroots game as well. You know, all of a sudden you had little girls who wanted to be the next Ellen White. They wanted to be the next Leah Williamson, Chloe Kelly. Um, you know, I used to, used to raise an eyebrow if I saw, you know, walking down the street, an England shirt with a women's player's name on the back. Now you see them everywhere. You know, it's not just England England shirts. It's Arsenal shirts. It's Chelsea shirts. It's Man City shirts. It's not just little girls that are wearing them. It's men. It's boys. So, yeah, it's, it, it, was, it was a huge moment, not just for those players that day, but for those players moving forward, because what we saw afterwards, you, you would never have seen if we hadn't won. It's real social change we're talking about. And, um, well, it was a long time coming. It was a long time coming. So thankfully we're here now. I have this theory that for the women's game to uh, thrive, it has to have its own identity. And it does. It does. But what is that identity? How different? I'm thinking in terms of if you compared it with, and this is an analogy that many people might recognize, the way that the women's game is played in tennis, um, certainly on grass, very different from the way the men's game is uh, played. That's why when sometimes you get somebody like uh, Serena Williams that can hit the ball as hard as the men, it's obviously a problem for for um, other women playing the game. In that, with that comparison, how different would you say the women's game is and, on, and on a national how, basis? How much of much this different else? identity is not just what happens on the field, it's the atmosphere in which the, in which the game is watched? A kind of less less beard up, even coked up kind of kind of atmosphere. Yeah, it's, it's it's two really interesting points, both on the pitch and off the pitch. So, I think where where the women's game will kind of find its own identity is when people stop making the comparisons. I think you still have a, a, you know a, not a number of people who will watch a women's game and they'll say, "Oh, it's not as good as the men's, is it? It's slower? It's you know, it's not as not as physical." Um, and, and they're right. You know, you can't beat science. Women's players are not as fast as men's players. But what they are is they are just as dedicated. They're just as hardworking. Some of them are incredibly technical. Um, you know, we are seeing the uh, the standards improve immensely. Um, goalkeeping was a real, um, I think, area of um, scrutiny for, for a lot of people. Um, and that was largely down to a lot of those goalkeepers not having full-time goalkeeping coaches. You know, they were, dare I say, either self, self-taught or they were, you know, part-time goalkeepers with part-time goalkeeper coaches, you know, and you're never going to get to the levels that you want to if you don't have that time on the grass and you have, you know, a full-time coach that's helping you. So we now have full-time goalkeeper coaches. We're seeing the standards of goalkeeping go up immensely, not just with Mary Earps, obviously winning, you know, goalkeeper of the year. She won sports personality of the year. We've got other goalkeepers as well. T you know, Chilean goalkeeper Tiani Endla, who plays for Lyon, one of the best in the world. I've seen her play for the last few years. is is phenomenal. Um, you know, I think where where the where the women's game will have its own identity is allowing it to develop its own identity, allowing it to be standalone. Um, it's really interesting that you make the comparison, Dotton, with with tennis. We don't. I've just watched Wimbledon and at no point did I think, God, they don't hit the ball as hard as the men or they're not as fast as the men. I just appreciate it for what it is. Um, and I hope that people will get to that stage on the women's uh, on women's football. With, with the crowds, it's a really interesting one because I think women's football is a little bit of a crossroads with the crowds. So one of the reasons that people get into women's football or feel comfortable going to the women's games is because it's they feel it's a safer environment, perhaps more inclusive. You see a lot more LGBTQ it's flags. Cheaper, and, cheaper. cheaper. It's, it's more that. affordable. Yeah, it's more affordable. It's, 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 it is. In a, in a cost of living crisis that we've had, it's more affordable. Um, but also you don't go there and, and, and in the past you've not heard the language. You've not, as you say, you don't have beard up, um, beard up supporters. People are going there because they love the game, because it's an affordable day out. 
what you're now seeing is club rivalries are now starting to develop. You're now starting to see, um, I wouldn't say that you're seeing abuse in the stands. I think that would be inaccurate, but you're now starting to see a little bit of banter that maybe wasn't there before. You have a new kind of um, group of supporters that have been attracted to the game off the back of the Euros win that maybe weren't interested in women's football beforehand. You've seen the emergence of Manchester United didn't have a professional women's team until six, seven years ago. They've now brought supporters along who aren't familiar with the culture that we used to have. Mm -hmm. They're familiar with the culture that they've been used to watching the men's team. So we are now seeing the game change a little bit where there is a little bit of needle. There is a little bit of rivalry. Some people like it. Some people don't. The people who are maybe more old school aren't necessarily liking what they're seeing creep in. Whereas those that are new to the game, oh, I love it. I love going to the game and, you know, giving, giving the opposition a little bit of, you know, a little bit of crap. So, um, yeah, it's, it's really interesting where we're at at the women's game because we're nowhere near what it's like for the men's game. But we're certainly seeing some, some of that creep into the women's side. So how much do you like your rock and roll, Kieran? I'm a fan. I've my, I would describe my taste of music as eclectic. Good, what, because what does you're going mean? to need that eclectic. What does that mean? From, from what to what? <laughs> from rock and roll to, I don't know, to, to hip hop to, to, you know, cheesy pop, you know, anything, anything and everything. It reminds me, you know, when you had a lesson, you're dating and someone, and like music's really important. What, what music do you like? I like everything. Fuck that. You know, <laughs> <laughs> but, but you like your Afro beats, eh? Burner Boy's in there with a couple of tunes. Bit of Nigeria like there, isn't there? Bit of Nigeria done. I had to start with that, mate. Um, we look at the charts of the um, week of the match that we talk about. And obviously, you know, we're talking about 31st uh, July uh, 2022. A hot day, as I recall. And you've got some hot music in the charts as well. Um, number one is something that I can't remember. And I'm not sure that I will remember in future. LF System with Afraid to Feel. You don't remember that, do you? Well, it's 1979. That's what it is. Oh, the charts. Well, th that song and quite a bit of the charts is, you know, it's it's a it's a groove from, it's a groove from my youth club adolescent days, you know, uh, and kind of remixed. Uh, and th 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 there's, there's there's a bit of a feel of 1979 about some some of this chart. That's because of Harry Styles, um, because he styled his album on like you know um, disco of the 70s to a certain extent, trying to modify it. And he's got about eight tunes in the charts. This is bonkers. This is the era of you know every single song in your chart in your on your album can get into the charts, and he's got loads of tunes. Um, I couldn't pick up out a the best one of his either of you pick out the best of the harry styles in the charts as it was is the highest one at number three at the moment but which i don't low. like it, it, it sounds i like didn't think eight, it was good yeah i actually, actually i've got time for some of his stuff some mm -hmm. of his summer stuff i like this you know you, you there's a certain sugar. kind of sound yeah yeah there's a certain thing about the vibe of summer that you want to be celebrated musically don't you yeah Yep, Kieran, Harry Styles fan or not? They even pulled out the flared trousers. I seem to remember. From I, this I album. don't mind. I don't mind as it was. I would be. I would be lying if I said I was a big Harry Styles fan. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm. I can appreciate that he's done immensely well. Certainly as a solo artist, obviously the off the back of One Direction. But um, I, I wouldn't choose to necessarily go and watch him live. I'm a bit more. Uh, I'm a bit more Coldplay or Elton John. Yeah, old school. Old school. Yeah, um, old school. Yeah, Coldplay, despite being sort of a generation after Elton John, at least, uh, they, they do feel old school, don't they? Mr. Brightside's in there, though, the killers, with uh, a little twist on rock and roll, I guess. And this is Mr. Brightside coming back into the charts at number 61, isn't it? I'm quite relevant because obviously they burst into Mr. Brightside after England had uh, they paused their That's concert right. at the weekend, didn't they, to, uh, right. to let people watch the end of the semi final and then burst into Mr. Brightside. There you go. Uh, spaceman Sam Ryder, who we didn't know much about until around this time is in the charts, low down at number 71. Spaceman's going downwards, um, I see from this. What did you make of the charts on the whole, though, uh, Kieran? Did, was it a chart that – was there any particular theme or otherwise that stuck out? I have to be honest, it's not – it's not – I think with the way the charts work now, it's largely, or correct me if I'm wrong, it's kind of very broadly based on streaming, isn't it? And um, 
you know, I guess I, I'm one of those that doesn't really pay an enormous amount of attention to it. Um, because as you've just rightly said, as soon as an artist releases a new album, um, it's it's probably played to death on the streaming platforms and, um, you know, will determine a lot of the of, of the places. I'm sure when you're um, when you're doing these podcasts and Taylor Swift has released a new album, the chart is going to be um, probably one to ten of her songs. So. Um, yeah, it's not it's not something that I necessarily take a lot of interest in. Um, I think it's just one of those where you stick to you stick to what you like, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does make sense. And the part of the problem is that we don't consume this music when you know you go onto uh, the streaming sites. We don't consume it together anymore. Mm. And mm. the fact that you've got several tunes from, I mean, it's not that long ago, of course, that the Beatles held the record for having, you know, the most uh, songs in the top 10 kind of, and that was like two or three. Uh, but now when you have so many different songs to consider, you don't have enough time to absorb them fully. You know, there are very few memorable songs here. In fact, George Ezra, who's kind of old school, but going back to maybe the early 60s or the late 50s, his tunes are the ones from this chart that I remember off the top of my head. Uh, further down is the re-release of uh, Shotgun. So it's come back into the charts because he's got another one at this point, which is uh, Green Green Grass at number four. But I remember it. You know, I remember the song. I can almost sing along to it. Not that I'm a George Ezra fan, but because it's an old-style uh, melody with a old-style refrain that you can sing along to. And that's why Shotgun was a hit in the first place. All the kids used to sing it. Uh, it was very simple, you know, whereas I, I think... Um, a lot of the songs tend to be about the uh, danceability rather than the um, memorability of the songs. Well, that's a shame because I wanted to round off this conversation in a very positive way. Uh, England, well, how about, after all, what, what about, uh, is it Tie On Wayne? Tie On Wayne, which was that? T On Wayne, Tie On Wayne. I'm 59 for crying Oh, right, at number 10, at number 10, I have TK. Yeah. Go on then, uh, yeah. It, well, this, this is a question more than anything else because this is London Nigerian. You know, he's 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 the he's the kid of, is of he? yes. I didn't know he's, that. He's, yeah. Yes. Although, and see, this this fascinates me. He speaks kind of Jafakan. Well, it, yeah. This, this universality of the 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 Africans English now speaking speaking Jafakan. Even though wait, there hasn't wait. been a wave of, of Jamaican Im immigration careful. for a long, long time. Be, be very careful where, where, when you call it Jafakans, because the Africans would argue, hang on, we were there first, and any sort of... Uh, in fact, the late, great Louise Bennett might acknowledge that as well. She's got an amazing poem, Jamaican, real greatest poet to come out of Jamaica. First... Uh, poet to use patois as a resource and to be proud of the um, colloquial uh, form of English that Jamaicans speak. But she would say, look, it's, it's from our African forefathers that we got this. In fact, a lot of the words in your Jamaican patois are from Africa. You know, they, they say exactly the same words as uh, we do if you go to Pidgin English. And this is a really important point. If I said that there was a theme in this for me, it is um, how, through Burner Boy primarily, but how what they call Afrobeats now, not to be confused with Fela Kuti's Afrobeat, which was a musical style, um, what they, what they uh, call Afrobeats today has taken on a, um, or studied how reggae became great through particularly MCs from the 1970s and early 80s, but they've done it in a dance hall way, way, which is probably more 1990s. But there was a trajectory of Jamaican success, how Jamaica brought patois and uh, rapping, if you like, into their musical form. Afrobeats has taken that. So when you see Burner Boy, for me, he's like a Jamaican rapper. Mm -hmm. That's the source of where he right. comes from. and. Our West African patois is not dissimilar, as I've 
intimate or intimated from Jamaican patois. So they do it in a style and bring it all together. And that's what's made it successful. You see this with um, very contemporary Indian music, British Indian music. But what are they doing? They're rapping. They yeah. are rapping. Yeah. More and of, often with a kind of Jafakan inflection. Yes, if the old school ones did, um, like Apache Indian did when he came out. In fact, he was as J- Jafakan as you like. I thought he did, did a pretty decent job, to be honest. But yeah, they've all done it. We've all been inspired by that music. Grime music is based on Jamaican mm-hmm. rap music. And so is hip hop, etc. So, for someone who's, who's I've been abroad now 30 years, uh, and the thing that's really noticeable for me, and you see it in music, and you also see it in football, is the African English. Now, I don't remember this so much. You know, it, it, it was it was Caribbean. The footballers and the, and the were, were were of Caribbean origin. Now, you know, look at Mark Gahey and Bukayo Saka and so on. It's the Africans and, and this in the music as well. And this is a big change, I think, in the time that I've been away. Yeah. <sighs> I, do you mind me just saying one thing, Kieran, and I'll allow you to um, give your thoughts on this. I would say the Jamaican influence or the Caribbean influence is still runs through. The, well, this is the point uh, I'm veins. making. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I know. Jamaican. <laughs> no. Well, no, because that's the dominant language in, yeah. in the streets, certainly of yeah. London. And, you know, you went back to talk about how women's football is very white because it's very sort of suburban or otherwise. It, we're talking about urban kids, you know, whether it's Jude Bellingham or whoever. It, invariably, we're talking about urban kids. And in London... Um, or in Jamaica, it's funny, uh, when um, Musi, um, Musiala, Jamal Musiala was being um, interviewed, because the uh, the German midfielder, Jamal Musiala, arguably uh, one of the best players of the tournament, he could have played for England. And he what did. a difference it would have made. <laughs> well, know. yeah, not but for the senior team, though. Yeah. yeah, not for the senior team. And when they, he was being interviewed, you know, they said to him, well, what happens if Germany meets uh, England along the way? And he said, well, you know, my boy, my the way he said it, it was straight out of London. He was like, yeah, but we've got my boy Jude there because him and Jude Bellingham had grown up together uh, playing for England and there's pictures of them together. Yeah, but I still got my boy Jude out there. You know, it's kind of like, that's not German, mate. No. It influences everybody. Sorry, Kieran, do you want to add anything to that? No, no, I think I think it's a I think it's a really valid point. And and if you're sort of looking, you know, looking to to sort of apply that to, to the women's game and trying to see more representation, I think, you know, we will we will see that. I think we will see more more players from those backgrounds coming into the into the into the fold. And, you know, we're seeing already, you know, one of the I think one of the potential players that we could see go on to win a Ballon d'Or is Lauren James, obviously Reese oh, James's yeah. sister. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, we, we, I mean, a phenomenal, phenomenal generational talent. You know, I was, I'm old enough and was interested in women's football long enough ago to have watched Kelly Smith. And Kelly was a, a joy to watch. You know, when, when people talked about Marta over here, they talked about Kelly Smith, you know, Kelly was talked in the same sort of, um, you know, same sentences as Marta as being as talented. Marta will probably go down as the greatest, but Kelly is not far behind. Lauren James is the next Kelly Smith. You know, she can do everything. Um, and if there are young black mixed race girls who are looking for someone to look up to who they can try and emulate, there's very few better than than what Lauren James is, is currently doing. I'm sure well, all of the- these themes are covered very, very well in your book. Please tell us its title. Tell us where we can get it and use this opportunity to plug away like a pluggery, pluggery, pluggery plug thing. <laughs> I appreciate that, Tim. So the, the book is called The Making of the Women's World Cup. I co-wrote it with a, a, a journalist based out in the United States, Jeff Kasuf. so I do not want to take all the credit for it. Um, and essentially, we tell stories from across the various tournaments that have taken place from 1991 through to... 2015 we'd released it just before the 2019 world cup so um yeah various stories in there that um that we were really privileged to be able to write Kevin Tiva Manaharan, thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, we've been talking about the England game, England winning the Euros in 2022. Uh, when the Lionesses brought football home, they said it was coming home and they think it's all over. Well, no, it's not quite. 